The abundance of the heart. Amen. So, brother, if, if y'all can go ahead and, and set that up for me, please. Brother Angel, do you mind to give him a hand, please? And I need one volunteer who doesn't write in Chicken Scratch. One volunteer. Anybody? 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 All right. My brother Ray. Can y'all give a hand to this willing vessel right here? Amen. So I want to I wanna do something tonight. You know, and uh, of course, the pastors were all in one accord, so they always steal my illustrations. I want to do something that's not done very commonly anymore, which is just to share what you're grateful for this Thanksgiving. You know, and I believe that when we go through our struggles, when we go through our trials and temptations, we often lose sight of every single blessing that God has given us. You know, we lose sight of every good thing that God has done in our life, and we just focus on that one negative. So just some basic ground rules. I don't want anything basic, anything plain. I don't want anybody sucking up and saying, I thank God for Pastor Juan or anything like that. But let's, let's actually get deep tonight because there's so many times we can lose sight of what we're grateful for. Amen. So we're not formal here in the house of God. If you just want to stand up and shout it out, you can. Anybody? Anybody want to stand? Go ahead, brother. Freedom. Freedom. Amen. Go ahead and write that down, my brother. Anybody else? His love. The love of God. Anybody else? Go ahead, my sister. Communication with the kids. Restoration of every relationship. God's forgiveness, His unending mercy and grace. Who else? Go ahead, sister. God's healing. God heals all wounds, amen? Not just physical, but spiritual and emotional as well. Anybody else? Hers was God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Yes, ma'am. God's faithfulness. He's faithful even when we are not, Amen. Who else? Another one. The pastors have all the answers, if you didn't know. Only one. Only one per pastor. Who else? Okay. Renewing of the mind. Meditating on the word daily. Who else? That's my favorite scripture. Okay. Your husband. The promise. The covenant. Amen. I didn't hear anybody else shouting that one out. <laughs> Who else? Our children. Our children. Amen. Well, those are just some things that we need to focus on. Amen. When times get tough, we need to remember every good thing that God has done in our life. Amen. Brother Ray, thank you so much for your help. Thank you for being the only one to raise your hand and, and come up and just be used by the Lord. And as you heard, people are grateful for God's healing, so the Lord is going to heal that wrist. Just... Wait for the blessing to arrive, my brother. You know, and I believe right now in the house of God, we can separate it in two sections. You know, I believe there's people that come in and they look like they've been snacking on sunshine and rainbows all day. I mean, they come in, they're, they're smiling ear to ear. You know, and you, you greet them and you want to shake their hand, but they run up and they hug you. You ask them, hey, brother, how's your day going? I'm like, man, praise God, my day is going so good. God is so faithful. God is doing amazing things in my life. God loves me. God loves you. How is everything with you, brother? God bless you. Thank you for asking me. And you kind of just like, you know, and, and then there's the people that, you know, they come in and, I guess you can call them sourpuss because they got that face like, like this, like they've been sucking on pickles. My daughters love pickles, so they always, they make that face, but these people, they come in and they make it their God. You can go ahead and sit down, brother. Thank you so much. These people make it their God-given assignment to spread their misery. They want to complain and whine and be critical to the point where you get tempted to complain and whine about them being critical. You know, and these people come in and they just think, man, I want people to feel how I feel. I want everybody to the negative instead of the positive. You know, and the very people that come in that emanate sunshine and rainbows from their pores are the people that are eager to share what God has done in their life. Those are people that are eager, just excited with zeal to share God is moving in my life. And the people, the sourpuss, the sour patch kids, they probably couldn't even feel this one. I mean, you ask them, what is God doing in your life? It's not to say that God isn't moving in their life. 
But when you ask him, what are you grateful for? I'll give you something little like this. You know, and I just want to use Pastor Jaime for my illustration. Like always, he's faithful to the house of God. He's always right here in the front and center. You know, with a smile. So when Pastor Jaime comes in, right, he's emanating sunshine and rainbows, right? He's smiling ear to ear. He's excited. He's eager, right? Right? So let me ask you, I mean, you're a pastor, right? So you're, you're perfect. You live a perfect life. I mean, you, you, have a, you have a small business that the Lord just gave you. Like, the Lord just gave you this business. Here you go. You're a pastor, so I'm going to give this to you. You go out. And you quote a job, and you tell them, okay, it's going to cost this much money, it's going to use this much material. And then you have material left over in the end, not because you cut corners, but just because your team works in excellence and God is just providing. And not only that, the customer comes up to you and thanks you for your hard work. Your customer thanks you for reflecting Christ. Your customer tells you, I'm going to go on Facebook, Instagram, social media, and I'm just going to blow up, bless men remodeling, and make sure everybody knows to use you. You're perfect, right? I mean, you just have a perfect life. You're just blessed like that, right? You see the halo. You see the halo. I know when your workers go out in the sun, they're probably sweating. But I know when you walk out, just the Lord just sends a cloud, and there's just a shadow following you everywhere, right? Or do you have struggles like everybody else, but you allow the abundance of your heart to shine? You allow your love and your joy to shine. You know, I believe... Just from, you know, knowledge of Pastor Jaime and his testimony, what he comes up to share, he's been through struggles, he's been through trouble, but he makes a decision to choose joy. Amen. Now, I worked for Pastor Jaime for one week, and being realistic, that's the hardest I've ever worked in my entire <laughs> life. I mean, it was hot. The first day I was behind the bushes throwing up. I think I popped like four BC powders when I got home that night. I mean, I, I chug like two Gatorades, and I just, that's the hardest I've ever worked, honestly, my entire life. And I'm almost 30 years old. But for years, he's worked that job, and he still comes in, and he's smiling. You know, and he's still excited. You know, and he comes in, and I see him, and he's just, he's on his knees at the altar. He has his arms up in an act of surrender, and he's weeping tears of joy. And I don't say this to glorify the man, but to glorify Christ in him. And I see him, and I know that he chooses joy. You know, and Pastor Jaime, I just thank you for just being a reflection of Christ and allowing your light to shine. You know, of course, each and every leader here has something to offer. But when I see you, I just see that you choose joy. I know you, I know you have struggles like everybody else. I know you have problems. But you choose joy, and out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Amen. Amen. You know, and, and the reason that I bring this up is because, you know, when we come in, we have problems, just like everybody else. There's things that we can meditate on. There's things that we could prioritize. There's things that we could focus on. But just like Pastor Juan was saying last Sunday, when we lose sight of the calling of God, we're going to begin to listen to the calling of other people and other things. We're going to lose sight of who it is that God is calling us to be. And then we're going to begin to come a reflection of those very things that we've been meditating on. So I want to go to Luke 6.45. If you can put that up there for me, my brother. The intrinsically good man produces what is good and honorable and moral out of the good treasure stored in his heart. And the intrinsically evil man produces what is wicked and depraved out of the evil in his heart. For out of his mouth speaks the overflow of the heart. And I really want everybody to get that tonight. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, I believe so many people come into this church, this church, and it's like they put on a mask before they come in. And I don't mean a mask to hide their identity. I mean a mask is something that's it's still, it's lifeless. It never changes. It's something that's dead without life. So people come in. And I say this because I've been there at one point. You come in and there's no joy. Everything is just dead about you. I mean, worship starts and you see everybody with their hand raised, jumping and excited and crying and hollering and rolling around on the floor. And it's like, I can't do that because I have the weight of the world on my shoulders. I have every single problem weighing it down. And from there, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You begin to complain and moan and groan and you begin to not take serious the things of God. I know myself, 
coming into church, coming into service, it's like I would walk in and instead of greeting people, I would have to instantly go on Facebook and update at City on a Hill Church and do smiley faces and do selfies and make sure it's the perfect face and the perfect lighting. And it's meanwhile, I've missed the first 20 minutes of the service. You know, when the leader has been up there speaking or preaching, maybe worship was going on. And I'm so focused on that, that when I finally do pay attention, I'm lost. I'm like, man, what's going on here? Meanwhile, I should have been at the front. You know, and here tonight, if we're honest with ourselves, how many people can honestly say that they come and they humble themselves before the Lord? That they surrender themselves, that they throw their hands up and they say, Lord, whatever it is that's troubling me, I know that you're bigger. Amen. You know, even we begin to struggle with self-consciousness. I know, man, I don't want to be on the ground and people think like I'm sniffing carpet or something or they're staring at the patch on my head. You know, I get self-conscious. So I think, man, you know what? I'll just go home and pray. I'll lay on the floor there. And that way nobody can think weird thoughts about me and, and judge me and, and think, Man, look at that dude with the patch on his head. What is he doing over there? You know, but I don't, I don't do it. I, I come in and I say, man, I'll do it later. And I put it off and just, it never happens. You know, and I can honestly say when I made the decision to surrender to Christ, and I don't mean just saying it. I don't mean just showing up to church to fully surrender to Christ. I made the decision, man, I'm going to come and I'm going to sit in the front. I may not understand what's going on, but I'm going to raise my hands in worship. I'm going to throw up that spiritual funnel, and I'm going to receive that anointing that God has for me. You know, I'm coming in, and I don't understand the things of God. I don't understand the word of God. I'm going to take notes, and I'm going to make an effort to go after service and speak to the leader or speak to the pastor or whoever's presenting the material and ask him, I don't understand this. Can you explain it? I'm going to be open. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to share my struggles and where I'm at and what I'm dealing with, but share at the same time, I don't want to live that life anymore. You know, when I know as somebody who's been previously hurt, who's been previously betrayed, it's hard sometimes to just put our walls down and be open and be honest and just fully trust somebody. This is my weakness, and I'm trusting you not to criticize me. I'm trusting you not to betray my trust and talk behind my back. I'm trusting you to encourage me when nobody else has. You know, and the thing is, we have to come in. We have to seek discipleship. We have to seek guidance. That's the only way that we can grow. If we come in and we sneak to the corner where nobody can hear us and we speak to the pastor, but we only share half of our problem, isn't it obvious that we'll only share half of a solution? How can you receive true help if you don't open up about your problems? I mean, you have to be open and honest. You have to be realistic. Each and every person here has struggles. I know. I have struggles. I know my pastors have struggles. But meditating on the word and spending time with the Lord, there's a relationship developed. There's a discipleship, both the inside and outside of the church. You know, when... I believe even when we get to that point where we're like, man, okay, I'm saved, right? I gave my life to Christ. We, we say, okay, I'm just going to please God. I'm not going to please anybody else. As I'm rolling too deep. Anybody ever said I'm rolling too deep, me and Jesus? We're like, Okay, I'm a pleaser of God. I'm not a pleaser of man. So I can cut people off in traffic. I can drive 85. I can, you know, walk in front of people in the grocery line. I, because as long as I'm pleasing God, he's happy with me, right? You know, we, we have this idea, I know I did, okay, I quit drinking, I quit smoking, I quit snorting coke, I quit popping pills, I quit pursuing women, I stopped cussing, but I wasn't speaking blessings. You know, when I, I had this idea of, okay, I'll just take everything away, but I didn't make a decision to fill that void back up. So I had that emptiness that I didn't know how to feel. I made the decision, right? I made a decision, okay, I'm going to pursue God. But I didn't make a decision to read the word and learn about God's personality, God's character, who God desires for us to be. You know, I had that emptiness, that void in my life, you know, and just if I can be realistic here tonight, in the beginning of my walk, I would be negative. You know, I would criticize I would get offended easily. I know sometimes, you know, the pastors would approach me and be like, 
I ain't got time for that. I'm showing up to church. That's enough right now. I'm not trying to be a pastor or nothing. I'm just, I'm just here. You know, and the thing is that negativity, that criticism, the grudges, the bitterness, everything that I had been holding on to that I was afraid to let go of, out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth was speaking. I was being critical. I was being negative. You know, I was coming in, and I just would start to see things wrong with the, the building, like little silly things. And it's like, man, are you really here for that? But when I made the decision of being open and being honest, and I really had that decision to change, I recognized what I thought was strength, acting superior, acting proud, acting boastful was really a weakness. You know, and I realized at that point, man, I really have an issue taming my tongue. So what would I do? I would meditate on the word. And of course, my wife can bear witness. Sometimes the tongue still tries to run wild and she has to, you know, correct me sometimes. But uh, it's, it's a constant battle. You know, it's something that we deal with. You know, and it's honestly, you know, each and every person here, what can you say? What measures do you need to put in place in your own life? For me, it was just realizing that the words that I was speaking weren't building anybody up. They weren't edifying anybody. And really, they're just making me look bad. You know, and I remember back in the day, and I know some of y'all too, y'all can, y'all had that silver tongue anointing, right? Y'all could just go and y'all could get that deal. You could get that deal. We're like, man, I just, I robbed him, man. I got him. You know, and it's, it's like, man, the secret to success was listen, wait, then speak. Every time it worked without failure. Let them speak, let them speak, listen, wait, and then speak. But thinking about my spiritual walk in the beginning, so many times people would approach me. And before they could even finish speaking, I would respond in a way that was rude, that was critical, that was negative. You know, and I wonder how many times with my own tongue, I talked myself out of a blessing by being negative, by instead of speaking blessings, speaking curses. You know, and I want to go here to the book of Filipinos. You know, I, I call it the book of Filipinos because I thought, I thought when Paul was writing to the people of Philippi that they were from the Philippines, but it turns out that they're actually from Greece. So I was looking that up. I'm like, man, why don't they call it the book of Filipinos? But, uh, Brother, if you can put that one up, Philippians 4, Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Do everything without murmuring or questioning the providence of God, so that you may prove yourself to be blameless and guileless, innocent and uncontaminated, children of God without blemish in the midst of a morally crooked and spiritually perverted generation, among whom you are seen as bright lights, beacons shining out clearly in the world of darkness. So let's be open and honest here in the house of God, right? We always want to speak the truth. How many people here, show of hands, and I'll, I'll go first, have at one point or even now struggled with being critical, with being negative, with recognizing the blessings of God in your life, recognizing everything that God is doing in your life? Everybody? Okay, everybody else is not raising your hand. You're probably lying in the house of God. It's all right. We're going we're gonna to pray for y'all. Y'all being judgmental. <laughs> Amen. You know, and just thinking of an illustration of this, of just a heart of joy, heart of abundance. You know, I began to think about little Ray, Ray Jr. You know, when uh, I came in, I think it was a Sunday morning. And, I mean, I was tired. I hadn't had my coffee yet. And I was, you know, just made the drive. And I remember little Ray ran up to me, and he was excited. But he ran up so quick, I, I thought he was going to, like, take or something because he just ran up like quick and it took me a few minutes to realize like okay this dude has a bible in his hand you know and he just ran up like brother 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 i want to read you this i want to read you this brother you can put that up there if you want james 5 14 which says is any sick among you let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the lord and i remember him telling me with excitement with zeal brother i was sick I was really sick, and my dad, we read this scripture together, and he put the oil on me, and he prayed for me, and God healed me. I remember. I, re I mean, I remember. Do you remember that? I remember. He was so excited to share what God had done in his life. I mean, a, a miraculous transformation. Not only that, but he was excited to share what God had did. 
You know, and it makes me think how many of us have seen or witnessed something like that and we don't share it. You know, maybe we even dismiss it as common and after a few weeks, we forget about it completely. You know what I can, I can bet, I'll bet money on it. Each and every person here, I'm willing to bet that God has intervened like that at least once in life. Right? I mean, am I wrong? But you know, how many times have we made a decision, just like little Ray, to be excited, to be full of zeal, to share what God has done and is continuing to do in our life? You know, and even, you know, like Pastor was saying Sunday, you know, so many times when people, our coworkers or our family, you know, they find out, okay, you started going to church, right? Okay, you're reading the Bible, right? Okay, you Mr. Holy Roller, right? Or our coworkers, okay, so since you go to church, you're perfect. You know all the answers to every question. You know everything, right, because you serve God. And we have to remind them, brother, if I knew all of life's answers, why would I have to study the Bible? Why would I have to pray if I already knew the answer to every question? You know, if, why would I have to seek the presence of God if everything was perfect? I don't seek the presence of God because I'm perfect. I seek it because in my imperfection, he's building me up. He's drawing me closer to the man that I'm called to be. I know that it's only with the, the spiritual renewal and the renewal of my strength that I can continue to fight this fight that he called me to. You know, and I don't speak of my perfection again, but I speak of imperfection. You know, I tell people, look, I mess up just like you. Sometimes I aim and I miss a target. But God continues to love me and God continues to pursue me. No matter what, even when I don't pursue God, he pursues me. God is faithful even when I'm not. Even when I don't love and believe in myself, God loves and believes in me. You know, and just that's enough to share with somebody, just the abundance of your heart, just the very message that you want to share with them. Let that light shine. Amen. And I know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be realistic here. I'm not like my pastors. I'm not super saved. I don't, you know, you can go to the pastors and you can start a scripture and they can finish it for you. And then depending on the translation, they can tell you what page it's on, right? Right. I mean, every, everybody that we talk about in the group, we're like, I know Brother Mike, we're talking about, man, I started the scripture and pastor just finished it. Like, man, pastor's like super anointed today. You know, but I have faith. I have confidence that not on my own strength, but the strength of Christ in me, that I can go out and I can minister a word to somebody and I don't have to sneak off to the corner and, and text one of the pastors and ask him for advice or ask him for a scripture. I don't have to go pretend to go to the restroom and Google search, okay, scripture on lust. Pop it up, okay, okay, this one looks like it'll really hit him between the eyes, so I'll hit him with this one. And I'll act super spiritual like I was in there praying and fasting and, you know what I mean? I believe and I have confidence that wherever I go, that the Lord can give me an assignment. You know, and just like we were talking about, Brother Ray, we were talking about the other day about pre-gaming. Some of you here are old enough to know what pre-gaming is, right? Y'all know what pre-gaming is? Everybody here? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Y'all were born saved. Okay. For those of us that were born sinners, back in the world, okay, we would pre-game, okay? So when we were going out to a party or a club or store, we would consume something, we would partake something, we would pop something, drink something, shoot something up, take a bump, whatever it is to enhance the experience and make it a hundred times more effective and more fun, right? Because everybody knows you can't have fun without being high, right? So why is it, now that we serve Christ in the spirit, we can't spiritually pregame? You know, and we were, we were talking about this, me and Brother Ray, you know, because, think about, I'm using an illustration, okay? You're going to the club, and you're waiting in the long line, and you're sober, so you're waiting in the long line, you're already mad, you're ready to go home, and then you get in, and then there's a long line at the bar, and then you get in, and they're playing a song that you don't like, so you're kind of doing like Night at the Roxbury, and you're just pretending like you're feeling it, and you're just kind of looking around and seeing who's there, and you're not having fun, you're already ready to go home, right? But when you pregame, man, you, the line went like that, and then you get in, and you don't even have to wait at the bar, as soon as you get in, you feel the energy, and man, you're off. You're popping and locking, you're wobbling and wiggling, and you're just dancing on tables, and you're just letting yourself run buck wild. So can we come in and run buck wild in the house of God? Can we spiritually, spiritually pregame? Can we take the extra time 
pray to read the word and be filled up so that just like in the world, we enhance the experience. We make it a hundred times better. We don't have to come into worship and only after three cups of coffee and only after the first four or five songs finally get into it. Or pan dulce. We don't have to wait for all that just to get in the mood. But we arrive eager, excited, and ready to experience everything. Not just like we used to, but even above and beyond. You know, and even... Making a decision before we go to work. You know, I know back in the day before I could walk into my job, man, I hated my job. So I had to sip on a little something, something before I went in. But now, you know, I'm at a job that the Lord has given me, that the Lord has an assignment for me. So when I'm driving to work, I'm sipping on Jesus juice, all right? I'm worshiping. I'm listening to sermons. You know, I'm allowing the Lord to minister to me. I'm reading sometimes or listening to it on audio and I have an anticipation that what the Lord is giving me to study, he's going to give me an opportunity to share. I have an anticipation, Lord, you gave me this word for a reason, not just for my growth, but to share with somebody else. You know, and just that idea of, man, you know, God, I want to be used by you. Having an attitude of worship, pre-gaming before you go anywhere, just like Pastor Jaime brought that word, but he didn't word it like that. Pre-gaming before you go anywhere so that the experience is enhanced. So simply going to the door, to the store to buy diapers and milk. If you pre-game before you go, man, you run into the old friends and you're just telling, man, Christ has made a change in my life. That old man is dead and I want to introduce you to the new man. I want to tell you what God has done for me. You know, being able to share what it is that God is doing in us and through us. You know, and I remember... Even first coming to the church, you know, and being honest here, no criticism in the house of God, right? I remember walking in, not to be disrespectful, but saying, man, there's a lot of Mexicans here. And I walked in, and literally, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being literal. I was the first, I was the OG. I was the original Wero. I was the only white person at City on a Hill Church. So I remember thinking, like, man, okay. Before I even met anybody, I'm already assuming everybody here only speaks Spanish, so what am I even doing here? You know, and before I even got to know anybody, I already made an assumption. I'm like, man, okay, there's cracks in the wall. I mean, I have to drive all the way to the hood, all the way to the bloody nickel. You know, when I live, I live an hour away. I'm used to being around the Wero's. I'm used to being around me, Rasa, okay? And then I develop a relationship with leadership, right? And so they begin to invite me out to eat, right? And... I'm going to these restaurants, and I don't even know what half of the stuff is on the menu. And, you know, I, I count myself blessed if there's a menu with pictures because I can just point and be like, okay, I want this one, but no green stuff, no white stuff, and don't cook it like this, okay? But, you know, after coming to the church and really developing a relationship with God, after being filled with the love of God, that drive didn't matter. It didn't matter that I was the only wero, and praise God, the Lord sent more of my people, you know, but it didn't matter that I went out to eat, and I was eating the same thing at the same restaurant. I mean, every Wednesday, we were going to Hot Waters, right? I mean, it, they knew us by name at Hot Waters. We were going there, and I was eating the same thing every time, but it didn't matter because, <laughs> because when I entered the building and when I left, I felt the love of God, and I mean, it... I didn't just feel it. It was hammered into me to the point where it began to seep and penetrate the walls that I had put up. Not only that, once I was filled with that love, I had the desire to go out and share it with others. You know, and as a young man, you know, I made a decision to really isolate myself from everybody else, including my family. You know, I, I was always alone. I never wanted to talk to anybody. I always wanted to deal with my problems by myself. You know, but once I had that love of God, I had that conviction of, man, I want to go back and I want to show love to my family. So everything that had been poured into me, I was able to share with my family. You know, when I didn't go up in the house, I didn't preach about Jesus. I didn't share what I was learning at church. I just allowed my light to shine through my actions. You know, I, I was coming around the house, not just when I needed money or I was out of food because I lived alone in an apartment. But I was actually calling my parents. I was checking up on them. I was telling them I love you. You know, and, and I'll never forget. You know, my dad's, he's not a very emotional person. He's not. I think my dad's never really hugged me my whole life. 
It's just always like that awkward side hug like, like this. Or, and that's only if he hasn't seen me in a long time. Otherwise, it's a, it's a handshake or it's a knuckle bump. So when I came in and I was reflecting Christ, not speaking words, but just the way that I carried myself, allowing my light to shine, I remember my dad pulled me to the side, and he's like, man, I'm so proud of you. And that just, that broke me because I didn't expect it. I had never really heard nothing like that. But just for him to tell me, man, you know what, son? You're doing good. You're going to church. You know, you're not running around like a knucklehead anymore. You're just, I'm proud of you, son. You're doing good. You know, and just like Pastor was saying, I want to encourage each and every person here. When you're with your family tomorrow, or even when you're going to go visit people you haven't seen in a long time, allow your light to shine. Let the abundance of your heart flow. Amen. You know, and I still, I still struggle being around family and, and other people. You know, to use a word that I uh, learned from little Jaime, sometimes I get anxious. Am I, am I saying that right? You can correct me. I'm not religious. I'm not going to get mad. I get anxious. Okay, so I made the decision. You know what? I want to continue to share God with those around me. You know, and I want to go ahead and, and start to close with this story, you know, because I know it's, it's getting late. So I want to tell you a story, right? And it's, it's a true story. There was this man at one point who just was always critical of everybody, always judgmental, always considered it his God-given assignment to prove everybody else wrong. He would force his opinion on everybody else, even to the point of getting physical, fighting them, and killing them. Now, one day this man has a true spiritual revelation, a true rebirth, and he fully surrenders his mind, his body, and his spirit to Christ. He finds out what his true God-given assignment is. Amen. So he begins to go out and minister and share the gospel and, and witness and tell people, look, this is who I used to be, but praise God when I surrendered my life to him, accepted him, and recognized him. He made a change in my life, and he can do the same for you. So one day, you know, he gets this idea, right? Has anybody ever heard the expression, all roads lead to Rome? Anybody? Yeah. Nobody? Okay. Only the worlds. So back in the day, Rome was considered a central hub for trading. All the traders, all the travelers, all the visitors would come to Rome from different cities and even different countries. So this man gets this idea, man, I'm going to go to Rome, and I'm going to preach the gospel. And these people that I reach, they're going to go back to their city and even back to their country, and they're going to reach people that I was never able to reach. So he sets his heart on this idea, on this goal, man, I'm going to go to Rome, and I'm going to witness. Everything that I say and everything that I do, I'm going to reflect Christ. But then there's a bump in the plans. Instead of entering Rome as a free man able to roam the streets and, and preach and teach the way that he wants to, he gets arrested. And he enters Rome as a prisoner. Now, at this point, he could have made the decision of, man, I'm going to be bitter. I'm going to be mad at God. I'm going to blame God. Or even just, I'm going to stay quiet. And I'm going to serve my time. And I'm going to get out for good behavior. But he really made that decision to choose joy. Because his heart was so full of the love of Christ. He made a decision, I'm going to speak and minister Christ, whether I'm on the streets or in the jail cell. That man was Paul. Paul. Saul of Tarsus to Paul, the disciple of Christ. So let's go to Philippians 1, 12 through 14. Now I want you to know, believers, that this has happened to me. This imprisonment that was meant to stop me has actually served to advance the spread of the good news regarding salvation. My imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become common knowledge throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else. Because of the chain, seeing that I am doing well and that God is accomplishing great things, most of the brothers have renewed confidence in the Lord and have far more courage to speak the word of God concerning salvation without fear of the consequences, seeing that God can work his good in all circumstances. You know, and just in preparation for this message, I was just listening to a sermon on that scripture and just, you know, the man of God was saying, Paul was in jail for two years. He never knew when that day was going to be his last day. But he continued to minister joy. He continued to minister Christ. Not only that, I want you to imagine for a second, for 24 hours a day, he's shackled to another guard, okay? So these are iron shackers. This, this is 
old stuff, okay? So his wrists were probably bruised, bleeding, cracked, possibly infected. But for 8 to 12 hours a day, he was chained to a guard. Can you imagine Pastor Jaime being chained to somebody for 12 hours? What do you think that he's going to talk about? What do you think is going to flow out of the abundance of his heart? Now think about this, okay? After that man left, when his shift was over, here comes the next guard. Now imagine, Pastor Jaime, they can't make an excuse. They can't pretend they're getting a phone call. They can't run to the restroom because they're tied to you for 12 hours. What, how would you handle that? I mean, just they can't go nowhere. They're stuck. And can we honestly say that in Paul's place, we would make the same decision, that we would speak the same words? You know, and with that, I just I want to ask every person here just to really consider what words have you been speaking? What have you been meditating on? Everything that's going right or that one thing that's going wrong? Have you surrendered yourself to complaining, to whining, to being negative, to being critical? Or are you continuing to speak the blessings of God over your life? You know, and, and with this, I'll just go ahead and close with Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good for building up others, according to the need and the occasion so that it will be a blessing to those that hear you speak. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him by whom you were sealed and marked and branded as God's own for the day of redemption, the final deliverance from the consequence of sin. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault-finding, and slander be put away from you, along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence, be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, and understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ has forgave you. You know, and I just want to encourage each and every person here, if you've had trouble realizing the truth, maybe it's because you haven't meditated on the real truth, which is the Word of God. If you're having trouble recognizing what God is doing in your life, what is it that you're truly focusing on and meditating on?